Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Ambassador Michael Oren to SALT Talks. Ambassador Michael Oren has devoted his life to serving Israel and the Jewish people around the world. As a member of Knesset and Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, he interacted with foreign leaders and defended Israel in the media. He spearheaded efforts to strengthen the Israel diaspora relations, to develop the Golan Heights, and to fight BDS. As chairman of a classified subcommittee, he dealt with some of Israel's most sensitive security issues. Prior to that, for nearly five years, uh, Ambassador Oren served as Israel's ambassador to the United States. He was instrumental in obtaining U.S. defense aid, especially for the Iron Dome system, and American loan guarantees for Israel's economy, which is uh, absolutely booming. A graduate of Princeton and Columbia, Dr. Oren was a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown. He holds four honorary doctorates and was awarded the Statesman of the Year Medal by the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Dr. Martin Luther King Legacy Prize for International Service. His last three books, Six Days of War, Power, Faith, and Fantasy, and Ally, My Journey Across the American-Israel Divide, were all New York Times bestsellers. He received the LA Times History Book of the Year Award, a National Humanities Prize, and the Jewish Book Award. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. He's also the chairman of SALT. And without further ado, I'll I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, Ambassador, thank you so much for uh, joining us today on SALT Talks. Uh, I sort of start these things the same way. I ask people, what is it about you that we can't find on your Wikipedia page? And I know you grew up in the United States. Tell us something about your uh, upbringing that led you to this career arc. Oh, I, I started off as a writer, Anthony. First of all, it's great to be with you. Thank you, John, for that very warm introduction. Um, I, I started off as, as a poet and a playwright and a screenwriter. Um, I won, when I was 17 years old, I won the National PBS Young Filmmakers Festival, first first prize. And with that, I, uh, with a short film, I went off to Hollywood and I became Orson Welles' production assistant. Um, those of you who are watching that film, Mank, it hits, it h- hits home. Uh, and uh, I just published my third work of fiction. It's a collection of short stories called uh, The Night Archer and other stories. And I have a novel, uh, To All Who Come Call in Truth, is coming out in May. Oh, congratulations. So, so how did you shift from that to the world of diplomacy and international relations and geopolitics? Well, it's never really shifted. It's always been there. But I must say that, that being a writer is a great tool for diplomacy. It, it enables you to understand um, people, understand situations. Uh, it makes you hopefully more articulate. Uh, and, and putting together your ideas and getting them across sometimes very difficult, you know, interviews or difficult audiences. And the audiences, as you know, Anthony, have gotten more difficult over the years. Uh, and so the writing part of it is a great tool. Well, listen, I mean, the audiences have gotten more difficult for me, but John Dorsey, for some reason, gets fan mail as a result of these Salt Talks uh, <laughs> ambassadors. So it's a it's a point of contention between me and my therapist. What's I just wanted to point that wanted to point that out to you. So so let me let me jump right into it though. The U.S. Israel relationship. If you had to characterize the state of that relationship today, how would you make that characterization? Well, it depends on which field. It, it, the U.S.'s relationship is a very special relationship. It, it, it is actually more special even than the you know the U.S. French, U.S. Italian, perhaps even the U.S. British uh, relationship because it, it has three pillars. Um, you know, one is obviously the shared democratic value. For all the challenges that these values are going through right now, the different interpretations, the fact of the matter is we've never known in Israel, we've never known a second of non-democratic governance. It's one of the few countries in the world like that, maybe five in the whole entire planet. Um, and we have elections. We have too many elections, as you know, uh, and, uh, and, a, and an independent judiciary and an independent press and all the basic rights of assembly and free speech. 
And that's in the Middle East, but even generally in the world, that's become a rarity. Um, so that's a very strong pillar. The other pillar is the defense pillar. And, uh, and here I say unequivocally that the U.S.-Israel strategic alliance is the deepest and most multifaceted that, that the United States has had with any other foreign power in the post-World War II period, because it encompasses so many different areas. It's intelligence sharing at the highest possible level. It's weapons development. You, you mentioned Iron Dome, John, is one of my, I brought the funding from Iron Dome, but that is one of a, a triple-tiered missile defense system which the United States uses. Um, Israel is developing uh, America's future battle tank. Israel is developing every gun on every destroyer in the U.S. Navy carries every destroyer the gun. Every American fighter pilot, get this one, whether it's a fixed wing or helicopter pilot, every American fighter pilot wears, wears an Israeli-made helmet. So it, it's special forces training. All of that is in the defense relationship. But there's another aspect of it, which I think is missing from, say, the U.S.-Italian and the U.S.-French relationship is, is the spiritual connection. Because America was and remains uh, a religious country, and more people go to church in the United States still than any country, and certainly in the West, uh, people read their Bible, uh, and God promises the Jewish people this land, and, and a lot of Americans take that very, very seriously. And so the spiritual tie um, is very, very deep, and I encountered that all the time um, in, in Washington, both, both on the Democratic and Republican side. And so it, it makes for a very strong bond. It doesn't mean we don't have differences. We've had some uh, some rather large differences in reaching the years. When you when you characterize Iron Dome, I, I just want to just relay it to people that have not been to Israel, and just want to say what Iron Dome is effectively. Israel is being assaulted by projectiles from the north and from the south, from the Gaza Strip. Uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like uh, ten thousand a year. Is that is that wrong? What's the number of projectiles that are entering Israel? Well, it's gone down. There has been days. I mean, during one war, I, I was in the military for about 35 years. I've been in a couple of wars where we were hit by thousands of rockets. Um, the, the Iron Dome, is, again, is this triple-tiered system. The Iron Dome takes out projectiles that go up in the air and come down. It's not a stand, standoff rockets. And uh, the U.S. Army buys them for the Korean border, for example, because the North Koreans use mortars and short-range rockets that can be taken out by Iron Dome. And it's the only anti-ballistic system of that nature that has been proven effective in combat in history. It's, it's very difficult. Look how many years it took the West to figure out how to take down like a V-1 or V-2 rocket. Very difficult. It's getting two bullets to meet in the air. The second is uh, David's Sling. And David's Sling is a U.S.-Israel project that can intercept a cruise missile, not a missile that goes up and down, but a missile that can be guided by a joystick. It's very sophisticated. And the third level is the arrow system, which is a missile that takes out a, a, a intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM that, that exits the U.S., the, the atmosphere and comes down through the atmosphere. Uh, our U.S. Israel rocket takes out that missile in outer space. And, and, and the reason why this is so important is that you've protected the land of Israel uh, by knocking out 90 plus percent of these projectiles, right? I, I was in a beautiful town in the south of Israel. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of it. You'll remember, but they took the Kasem rockets and they, they turned it into a menorah on top of the Yeshiva. Sterot. 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 Yeah, and I met, yeah, I met with fun. the mayor yeah. I met with the mayor of Starot as well, and I was very impressed with the way they were living their lives under that threat, but also recognizing that they were going to live a very wholesome and full life despite the threat of terrorism. Uh, and it was, it was enormously impressive to me. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is it speaks to the Israeli culture. And so country's doing very well right now. Tell us what some of the elements are of the Israeli culture that's allowing for this type of success? Well, we are, we are a highly diverse culture. People look at Israel, people who more or less look like me, maybe they have a little bit darker hair. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, Israel is, 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 non, is a majority non-Western country. A uh, majority of Jews here are from, uh, from, the, uh, from the East, from Arab countries, from North Africa, uh, from Iran and Iraq. Um, there are Ethiopian Jews, uh, Africans, um, you know, several hundred thousand African Jews. Um, there are 21 percent of the population is Arab, uh, mostly Muslim, but also uh, Christians, um, Arabs, Asians. It, it is it is racially, religiously, 
um, culturally diverse country, what all holds it together? A couple of things. Uh, the democracy is very important here. Democracy is, is, is not, not necessarily an end in itself here. It's also a means to social cohesion. It's a way in which all of these disparate ideologies and backgrounds can get together and, and scream at each other. And I've been in Knesset and it's, it, it, it reaches some very loud decibels there and, and sort of and, and blow off steam. And, and we, we can reach around political polarization here to the degree that it has plagued the United States. Um, it is a traditional society, society that, that manages to balance uh, modernity, uh, technology innovation with, uh, with tradition. Over 80% of the population is traditional, uh, which is very high and going up, not going down, in contrast to the United States and elsewhere in the West. And it's a family country. Um, and I think the family values here are, are very strong. Um, and it, with the with the United States and the West, it's also an important part of our relationship with the with the East. When you ever have Eastern visitors, and I did a lot of work uh, at the Prime Minister's office with 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 with, with Korea, with South Korea, with uh, Japan, and other Eastern countries, they always point to the fact that what we share is is our is our family values, and it really holds it together. Um, great premium on innovation. Uh, we're regularly listed the most innovative country in the world um, with um, per capita more startups or companies. About 250 international high-tech companies have at least one in our R&D uh, center here. Uh, a country like my, a company like Microsoft or Intel have four R&D major R&D centers here. Um, I shift gears ab uh, abruptly to talk about the Abraham Accords. Uh, and again, for our viewers, uh, the, the Israelis are normalizing relationships with countries like the UAE, Bahrain, I believe Morocco. Uh, tell, me, tell me what other countries you've uh, signed these normalization treaties with, Michael. Well, the Abraham Accords are, are sort of the, the uh, omnibus name for uh, the recent peace agreements between Israel, uh, Bahrain, the United Arab uh, Emirates, now the Sudan has signed on, uh, and, and a huge breakthrough in the peace treaty between Israel and Morocco, um, the largest and most influential North African country. Um, these accords um, have totally overturned and upended all of our assumptions about the peace process. The assumption um, that was regnant in the United States and Europe was that first you had to have peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and only then you'd have peace between Israel and the Arab world. And to get peace with the Palestinians, you had to create a Palestinian state, you had to redivide Jerusalem, you had to uproot a lot of Israelis who live in what we call the Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. None of that proved to be true. Uh, we have these, uh, or these, these, these treaties. These Arab countries remain committed to a resolution of the Palestinian uh, problem, but they weren't going to wait anymore. We're going to give the Palestinians hope. And uh, these accords um, also overturned the notion that first you make a peace agreement between an Israeli leader and an Arab leader, and then later on sort of normalization seeps in. So that was the paradigm of the, um, the peace accord between Egypt and Israel, the peace accord between uh, Israel and Jordan. These are now over 40 years old, these agreements. Um, and we have peace between Egypt and Israel, and we have peace with Jordan, but we don't really have peace with the Egyptian people or they have pieces with their with their leaders the new abraham accords have created a completely different paradigm it's normalization first peace will come later and we have peace with the bahraini people with the emirati people with the moroccan people we have dozens of flights now flying to them per week and i think that any future uh, peace arrangement between israel and arab states will resemble the abraham accords and not the cap david accords that were signed by Jimmy Carter and Anwar Sadat and Nafid Aguinal. It's, it's an obvious question, but I'd like to get your long-term view of this. So, uh, you know, close on Saudi, are you allowed to talk about it? Close sure. on some of the yeah, other sure. Arab nations? Uh, where, where, where do you think you are? I think, I think that the next in line would be a country like uh, Oman. Um, I wouldn't rule out the Kuwaitis at this point. Um, and, and but the Saudis, of course, is sort of the, the, the jewel in the crown because the Saudis have such a, a such influence throughout the, the entire Arab world and throughout the entire Muslim world because they are the custodians of the two holiest cities in Islam, uh, Mecca and Medina. But it also puts a check on some of their decision making vis a vis Israel, and we understand that. But there are many steps that the Saudis uh, can do, and I believe they will do in the coming years, particularly if the Abraham Accords uh, prove to be uh, both strategically and financially valuable. 
Um, and it's changed dramatically, Anthony, is that these very countries that used to look at Israel as an enemy now understand that Israel is an ally, that we share the same strategic interest in standing up to Iran. Uh, we also serve as a, a bulwark against Turkey. Uh, these, these Sunni Arab countries are afraid of Sunni Turkey because uh, Turkey backs Islamic extremists like Hamas. Um, so they're literally between a rock and a hard place. We're here. And this is sort of the more, I don't know, the more sensitive part of my answer is we're, we're looking at a period of withdrawal, of isolationism. Uh, it began under Obama. It certainly continued under Trump. Uh, I don't think it's going to change much under Biden. The American people are looking uh, inward, not outward. They're trying to figure out how to best police themselves and, and rather than try to how to best be the policeman of the world. Um, and as America pulls out, you know, geopolitics hates a vacuum like nature. It's going to fill up. It's going to fill up with Russians. It's going to fill up with Turks. It's going to fill up with Iranians. Uh, the Saudis, the Bahrainis, the Arab world, they must they are the power that's going to stand up for this region uh, against radicalism and, and Iranian hegemony. I, you know, I, I, listen, I, I travel throughout the region. Um, it's, it blows me away, uh, Ambassador, how much everybody in the region has in common with each other. And of course, I love the name Abraham Accords because it's about the father Abraham and the seven tribes. And basically everybody's all brothers. And so it, it's a, it's a, it's a warm way to provide the connectability. But what, what are the risks, sir? When you, when you step back and say, okay, there's been, possibly 60, 70 years, uh, let's call it from the founding of Israel, 72, 73 years ago, there's been this stress and tension in the area. Uh, what are the risks that you're worried about right now? Well, specifically, it'd be the outbreak of, of another round of fighting between Israel and Hamas, which is the Palestinian radical organization that controls Gaza. And we've had several wars with Israel, several. Um, an outbreak of war uh, between Israel and Hezbollah, in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah being a, a puppet a terrorist organization uh, in the pay control of Iran. Um, in either of these wars, both of these terrorist groups will be fighting in, in densely populated civilian areas. And there'll be a high degree of collateral damage. I'll give you an example. You mentioned the, the, the rockets early, Anthony. Um, Hezbollah has planted 130,000 rockets, all aimed you know, right here, right at our neighborhoods, right at our schools. At under 200 uh, southern Lebanese villages. And in order to get at those rocket launchers, our army is going to have to go into those villages, going to have to go into those homes. And Hezbollah is going to keep the civilians in there because they want us to kill the civilians because it will, it will delegitimize us and it will complicate our relationships with these Arab countries. So those could be very disruptive. Frankly, Israel should exercise restraint in undertaking unilateral moves in Judea and whether the, the next government will annex part of Judea and Samaria. And I'm not in government currently, but I would advise against it. I think our interest right now is in is, is allowing the Abraham courts to, 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 to sprout roots, to settle in and become a permanent reality in the Middle East. And we, and we shouldn't rock uh, that situation too much. Uh, the last great threat would be Iran. And um, here it's complex. There's a big question whether the United States will rejoin the, the Iranian nuclear deal of 2015, the so-called JCPOA. Uh, if that's true, Iran will receive once again, not tens, but hundreds of billions of dollars. They won't spend that money on schools and, 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 and hospitals, believe me. It's on more missiles, more terror, more conquests. And that could put tremendous strains on this alliance. Um, we don't know the degree to which the next administration will back these new alliances. Remember, they, you know, quite naturally, any administration doesn't want to give too much credit to the previous administration, especially given the political atmosphere in the United States right now. Uh, but we hope that the United States will continue to encourage our Abraham Accords. And I hope that this next administration will think not once, but three times before rejoining uh, the Iranian nuclear deal. Okay, but we both know, because we're both realists, that uh, and, and President-elect Biden has signaled that he wants to re-engage Iran. And so we're both realists about that. Um, and so if that were to happen, you just mentioned several of the things that are risks on the table for Israel and the Saudi Peninsula and the countries therein. Um, are there, are there, what, what, what do you recommend, let's say that you were the czar, let's say you got put in charge of the peace for the entire area, and you had five minutes with the vice president-elect, what would your message be to him? Hmm. I've had a lot of five minutes with the president-elect. <laughs> He's great. Um, and that is this. Um, 
In 2015, during the period of that accord, um, which started, the negotiations began in 2012, and they were negotiated behind our back. Um, in fact, we were pretty into on a daily basis, those negotiations. And this is about an agreement which impacts every man, woman, and child in this country and every man, and child in the Middle East. And the fact that the very people who are most impacted and have most to lose from this agreement were never even consulted about it. Um, is quite is quite astonishing. Uh, there's been much talk about how America betrayed allies in the recent years. This was actually a bona fide betrayal, and what was quite quite dangerous. So I would urge uh, the president elect not to uh, to try to rectify uh, that historic error and justice, and try to restore 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 trust. Uh, be very important, and, and to understand that the JCPOA does not block the path to the bomb. It actually paves Iran's path to the bomb. And that is the opinion, not just of the Israelis, it's the opinion of all our Arab neighbors. Uh, listen to us, listen to what we are saying. And we will have an idea of what a good deal would look like, a very specific idea of what a good deal would look like. Just listen to us. You know, the uh, uh, last year, uh, John and I hosted an event in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we, uh, we made history at that event, actually. We had the first Israeli venture capitalist come to Abu Dhabi and speak on a stage publicly at, a, uh, at an event in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, General Jim Jones, somebody I know that you know, the former national security advisor for President Obama, came to the event with us. And he said something that I'd like to get your reaction to. He said that he felt that the Iranian regime was going to not exist inside of five years. Do you think that that is true? How stable is that regime? You, it broke up. He said it won't be in existence. In the, yeah, I think yeah, it's very yeah. stable. Ge- General, General Jones I, I was is saying that the Iranian regime will not be in existence inside of five years. Uh, and uh, I was wondering what your reaction is to that and how stable is that regime? Well, the first reaction is I've heard the same, I've heard the same prediction since 1979. <laughs> it okay. hasn't happened. Fair enough. Uh, it hasn't happened. And, and, and now it's it's even less likely than before because the Iran regime had a dry run for the Arab Spring. It was the Green Revolution of June 2009. And the Iran regime learned how to put down a revolution. And they not only developed the technological means, uh, you, you, you put something untoward on your, on your Facebook and you're going to get a knock on the door within a minute and you're going to disappear. But they've developed a million man force. It's called the Besiege. These are thugs. And they will go out, there's a demonstration, they're going to go out and beat your head in. Or if they have to, use firearms. And this recent round of, of, uh, of protests, peaceful protests uh, in Iran, hundreds of civilians, unarmed civilians were shot down. They're not fooling around. So this is, this is a regime that right now, internally, there's no power that can overthrow it. Zero. Well, I have one last question. Then I have to turn it over to the millennial, okay? You know, Michael, which pains me, okay? Because I mean, the guy's got just John. John you've been yeah, very, and he's very got patient. fan mail yeah. coming in, and uh, I, I think he's going to start getting those portraits of himself that he signs and sends out to people, which is even more <laughs> revolting. But uh, I want to talk about the Six Day War, June of nineteen sixty seven, and the making of the modern Middle East, which is a book that I read. I also read Power, Faith, and Fantasy. And that's why I was so delighted to get the opportunity to meet you in the King David Hotel uh, when I was in Jerusalem a few years ago. But in the book, you talk about how that war and the victory, effectively, for the Israelis in that war has set up what we're living with today 50 plus years later. I'm just wondering if you were writing a book about the Six Day War today. Uh, do the things that you wrote in that book, are they still true? Have some things changed? How, how would you characterize Israel in terms of its development? If you were writing a history of Israel right now, uh, obviously David Ben-Gurion, the origination of Israel, the help from Harry Truman, et cetera, the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, and where we are today, how would you, how would you weave the whole history for us today? Well, the Six Day War was was instrumental in setting the map of the Middle East. It it, it ended the it sort of re, it, it represented the high water mark of secular Arab nationalism and ushered in the era of Islamic extremism, which has proved, uh, proved to be so profound in, in shaping the Middle East in recent years. Uh, ISIS is a direct um, result of that. 
Um, it, uh, it, it meant the sort of the, 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 the slow decay, the slow decline of Egypt as the ultimate regional power. Uh, and we've seen how that's played out. And the Six Day War brought the Russians into the Middle East very deeply. And we've seen that the Russians aren't leaving so fast. Uh, the question is how long America is going to stay around now. Uh, the Six-Day War gave birth to the U.S.-Israel strategic relationship, which I talked about earlier. It did not exist. Israel fought that war without a single American bullet. We had French arms then. No Americans. Amazing. And um, this war brought to the fore, I think, the ability to make peace because Israel had what to trade for peace, the territory for peace. It proved to the Arab world that even with all the Arab armies massed on our borders, they weren't going to destroy us. They're going to have to somehow come to grips with the reality, and that has happened. And interestingly enough, the Six-Day War provided the opportunity for peace with the Palestinians. And this is, this is the, the sort of counterintuitive interpretation of the, of, the, of, the, of the war, because you have to go back to this. No Palestinian was, Anthony. No one talked about Palestinian statehood. No one talked about the Palestinian people back then. It was the Arabs versus Israel, not the Palestinians. And the fact that is that the Palestinians now have a, a, an inchoate government uh, in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority. It exercises a certain degree of autonomy. It has elections if they ever wanted to hold them. Um, provides the possibility, the possibility, I stress, uh, for the realization of some type of Palestinian uh, autonomy and still, still after all, we've been through the possibility of a state solution. John, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to let you ask some of these questions that have come in from our, from our audience. Ambassador, this has been incredibly enjoyable for me. It's now going to get painful for me, me as he too. out. Thank you. It's now going to get painful for me as Darcy <laughs> outshines me, but it's okay. Go ahead, John. I'm ready. I'm ready. Everyone loves your shtick. Um, All right, John. Ambassador <laughs> Oren, I want to talk about what you alluded to earlier is that the United States is turning inward and we're having to focus more on policing ourselves than we are uh, policing the rest of the world. As a, you know, you, you're you're an American, you were an American citizen, uh, but as someone who lives outside the United States and, and views things through that lens, how does the rest of the world view the current unrest and divisions that exist in the United States? With, with growing sadness and, and concern. And uh, listen, that world it used to be called the free world. Remember that, that term? Does it sound antiquated yeah. today to your generation? Um, that was predicated on America's willingness and ability to project power. Um, when I was a, a young paratrooper participating in the battle for Beirut in 1982, we in the Israeli army, we knew if we got into, if we got into a scrap that the, President Reagan would send the Marines and get us out. Uh, and that's just what he did. They sent the battleship New Jersey. Well, there was battleships back then. Uh, um, that's not happening now. Um, the President Bush in 2003, um, back in 1991 earlier, uh, in the first Iraq war, the United States sent armies of 500,000 men to the Middle East. That's not going to happen now. And so for those of us who, who, for whom we view our security is very much attached to that possibility, that ability, that willingness of the United States to project power, this is a sea change for us. And we've had to do some, some scrambling. Um, we mentioned the Abraham. The Abrahams are animated on one level by a common recognition that we cannot rely on the United States the way we used to rely on the United States. America is still our ultimate ally, still shares our values, still has a strategic alliance with us. But again, the, the Marines aren't coming that fast, true? And, um, right. and that's a big difference, especially since we got the Russians. I got, you know, I, I did a lot of, of missions uh, abroad during my term in office, and I, I went, went to a, a mission to the Baltic countries, and they would complain that they had the Russian army two kilometers away from them. I said, guys, I got, I got the Russian army 20 meters away. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> you think you've got problems. So that's our reality here. In general, are you a believer in this idea of peace through strength? You know, there's a lot of people who believe that appeasement in areas like the Middle East and around the world, if you pull back and you create that vacuum of power, your ability to be the hegemon that, that dictates global peace recedes. Are you a believer in that philosophy? Empirically, it's true. I had an article recently in National Interest that actually is told it's like the end of engagement. I talked about how engagement has become sort of the sacred notion, almost engagement at every cost. But if you look historically, and I'm going back to ancient history, engagement almost never works. Uh, unless it's ba backed up by by significant force, then it works, and uh, and we have to be extremely cautious about this. Um, 
And I'm speaking in every country, by the way, and it's the right and the left, Republicans and Democrats, everyone's fallen into this. We engaged with Yasser Arafat, thinking that he was, by engaging with him, he was going to become a peacemaker. And he remained to this dying day a terrorist, a died in the world terrorist. It wasn't going to happen. Um, and, and we paid very big prices for this. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe in diplomacy. Diplomacy is a great tool, but it's got to be backed up by more than just goodwill. Right. You know, Anthony asked you the question earlier about what advice you would give to President-elect Biden on restoring trust uh, with Israel and, and in the region after what you believe was the misstep of the Iran deal. What, is your, what are your expectations for what the uh, Biden administration is going to look like in terms of its approach, approach to Middle East peace and uh, relations throughout the Middle East? Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken is, is very influential in Biden uh, administration's foreign policy. So what do you expect uh, from the Biden administration in that regard? Well, I've been privileged to know all the people now that he has appointed. Uh, Bill Burns now is the head of the CIA, you know, the Deputy Secretary of State, as well as the Secretary of State, the Deputy National Security Advisor, as well as the National Security Advisor. And I will tell you that every single one of them to the, per- per- to the person is 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 deeply committed to the U.S.-Israel alliance and committed to Israel security. Now, again, I'll say that doesn't mean we have disagreements. We're going to have disagreements about the Iran deal, particularly the Iran deal. Um, we'll have disagreements about the Palestinian issue, which is not going to be that pressing as it was during the Obama years. I think that, that President-elect Biden is less ideologically than Obama was on that issue. Uh, but we will have disagreements about it. And, uh, and a lot of it depends on what the Palestinians decide to do. If the Palestinians decide to, re- to rejoin negotiations, uh, then we'll be in, put in a, in a possibly more combustible relationship with this administration. Um, but generally speaking, I don't see any major policy changes in terms of, again, projecting power. Um, there'll be a tremendous um, uh, aversion to getting uh, embroiled again in any Middle Eastern uh, fight, any overseas uh, engagement militarily. Um, and I think this administration is going to have its hands more than full uh, with what's going on in the United States, uh, beginning with the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, uh, political polarization, and potentially even outbreaks of violence in the United States. Um, people aren't going to be thinking about the Middle East first and foremost, and maybe not even in, in a tertiary fashion. So let's talk about Israel's response to the pandemic, which you alluded to, which I think generally has been very good, and especially the vaccine rollout. You mentioned, I think, before we went live, uh, that you're getting your second vaccination in the coming days, maybe even tomorrow. Um, What's been the key to Israel's response to the pandemic that we can learn from here in the United States, as well as the uh, efficient rollout of the vaccine? So uh, here's the bad news and the good news. Let me start with the bad news. Um, today, we, we passed a 10,000 positive rate on the testing. It's very, very high um, for any, by any international standards. We have three populations here who are, I don't know, resistant to, uh, to suggestions that they should wear masks and, and this social why you're a Jewish, diplomat. Uh, yeah, Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, population, uh, they're not giving up on their weddings and their funerals and their, and their Torah study during the day. An Arab population that's not giving up on its weddings, uh, with huge weddings. And we here in Tel Aviv, I'm in Jaffa. And you guys got, I mean, if you were here on the beach, you'd be out there with, you know, thousands of young people on the beach. And, in, you know, in America, wearing a mask is kind of a political statement. You know, it says whether you're a liberal or conservative. Uh, here, it's, it's, a, it's a social statement. If you're wearing a mask, you're not cool. You're an old guy like me, Matt, okay? Young guy like you would be out there without a mask because it's uncool. Uh, so that's been, that's been difficult. Um, and we've had to now go into our third and a half lockdown, and, uh, which is very difficult. We are a country that is, again, a family country. Israel has the highest natural birth rate of any country in, in, the, in the modernized world. Uh, something of between three and five kids per family. And if you're a working couple, couples work here with three to five kids at home, it is really difficult, very difficult. Our economy is taking a huge hit, hit the highest deficit in our history. A $50 billion deficit was very high for us. And um, yeah, that's all the bad news. The good news is that we are a small country. We are all on a, a computerized health system. We all carry a card that tells every doctor, every hospital, exactly all the medications we've received. So we're a closed laboratory. And the makers of these vaccines, Pfizer's, Moderna, understand that if they want to see the impact of the vaccines on a closed environment, this is the place. So we've moved very fast. 
credit be done to the Prime Minister Netanyahu, who moved very fast on the phone every night to the CEOs of these countries. And he believes that by the middle of March, we'll be completely vaccinated. We'll be the first country on earth to be completely vaccinated. Again, I'm going for my vaccination uh, tomorrow, my second one. It's done so well, John, I can't say you go in there, it's clean, it's respectful, it's all computerized. You get message updates on your text messages all the time. They want to know how you're doing. Uh, they're reminding you. Well, it's pretty amazing in that way. We also have one advantage that the United States doesn't have, and this gets into somewhat sensitive area, and that is um, our personal uh, privacy laws are less rigorous than yours. You know, right. the founding fathers, God bless them, right. uh, you know, they sort of disperse power. There's this president, there's federal power, state power, local power, municipal power. Um, and it's very difficult to get a united policy around that. But the, the, the founding fathers also were very fearful of, of threats to American liberty. So they put in all these checks against people who might threaten liberty. Well, we didn't go through that process. So we have our equivalent to the FBI has a tracing system, which wouldn't be acceptable in the United States. But if I pass somebody in a grocery store, was tested positive for COVID, I'm going to get a message that's going to put me in isolation for nine days. Right there. And by the way, I was in isolation when I flew back from my father's illness. Uh, I had isolated Baltics flying back. Every day, twice a day, the Israeli police called me. Hi, Israeli police here. Are you in isolation? Just checking up on you. Like that, literally. So if I walked out of my room, believe me, someone's going to know it, and I'd pay a very big fine. Yeah, you know, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Uh, you know, we, we obviously love our freedoms that we have in this country, but uh, in the middle of a pandemic, it, it becomes a little bit difficult uh, when people uh, use mask wearing and social distancing as a political statement, as you mentioned. I want to leave you with one more question and your immense wisdom. Uh, you, you know, you, you understand how to diffuse extremism and, and live in an in a area of the world that it's always precarious. And in the United States, as we talked about earlier, we, we are seeing a rise in extremism. You know, we saw the, the disgusting events that took place at the Capitol a few days ago. You know, you have people with really extreme ideologies. I think a lot of people saw the image of, of a man with a Camp Auschwitz shirt, which was obviously disgusting. How do you think, if, if you were giving advice to domestic leaders in the United States, how do we diffuse this rise in extremism and these extreme divisions that we're seeing in the country without, uh, you know, talking down to people? You know, you had 74 million people who voted for President Trump and, and many of which still believe he's doing the right things. Uh, so how do we, how do we uh, sort of solve some of these divisions that we're seeing in the country? Well, to me, there's only one way. And, and we, we do it here. We ourselves don't do it enough, John. And that has to be for the dialogue. I'm also a writer. I write for American publications. And what all of us in our community of writers realizes is, is that what has died in the United States has been discourse, is the ability to talk to one another. Um, there used to be even publications where if you had a good idea, it didn't matter if it was right or left, you could publish in that magazine. You were judged on the quality of the idea and not on its political orientation. That has been lost. And what there has to be a, a national reconciling and introspection and effort map. Provide forums for people from different perspectives to meet on a, on a mutually respectable basis. And I can't think of any other way to do this. And having watched that polarization deepen literally in front of my eyes in Congress during the years in which I was Washington, you know, once upon a time, congressmen from both sides of the aisle would, would you know, they played cars, they go drinking together, they, they played basketball, they lived in the same boarding houses. It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. It's so sad. To me, that was the strength of America, that ability. And my distinguished colleague from across the aisle on, on, on uh, you don't see that anymore. But that's what it, 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 you have to restore the civility. What people didn't understand in Israel, and I don't know if they understand in America that much anymore, is that the civility wasn't just being polite. Civility was, 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 the, was a foundational idea for a society, for a civilization. It was the way that people from different walks of life and different outlooks could, could coexist. And that was part of America's great strength. And part of America's weakness that we're witnessing in the world is because of the very breakdown of civility. And so I think, as speaking as an Israeli, we have a profound national interest <laughs> in the restoration of American civility. Please right. start talking to one another. 
Yeah, and, and it's a beautiful part of Israel that a lot of people, I think, misunderstand is that you do have a lot of cultures, like you mentioned, that do coexist in harmony, that have different viewpoints on religion and, and, uh, and social issues, and you guys live together in harmony in, in a beautiful culture. So uh, we have a lot to learn from you guys over there. Ambassador Michael Oren, thank you so much for joining us here on Salt Talks. Anthony, do you have a final word for the ambassador before we let him go? Thank you. John. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I would say next year in Jerusalem to you, Ambassador, because I, because that's where I want to be hopefully next year, oh. maybe even sooner than that. We, we have our uh, SALT conference coming up, hopefully in the Middle East. And as a result of the Abraham Accords, um, um, I'm hoping that you will be present there. We can meet, meet with you live on stage, discuss all these great things that are happening. Great privilege. Thank you so much, guys, for hosting me. Be well, be healthy. Okay, and get vaccinated. Wish you the best. Yeah, you know, if I could get it, I would. I just have to wait yes. online right now. But as soon as, soon as they allow me to have it, <laughs> I'm taking we'll, it. We'll, have, we'll fix you up with something here. <laughs> All right, thanks, sir. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Be well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. And thank you, everybody who tuned in to today's Salt Talk with Ambassador Michael Oren. Uh, just a reminder, you can sign up for all of our future Salt Talks at salt.org backslash talks. And you can access our entire archive of Salt Talks at salt.org backslash talks backslash archive. Please follow us on YouTube. We're broadcasting all of these episodes of Salt Talks on our YouTube channel. Our, our followership is growing quickly on YouTube. We're very excited about that. So please follow us on YouTube and please follow us on social media. We air these on Twitter via Periscope as well. So please follow us there. And please also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn if you're on those channels. Uh, please tell your friends about Salt Talks. We love growing our community. We've been able to grow awareness of salt and all these discussions that we have during uh, the pandemic and the lockdown as we've had to postpone our conferences. So that's been extremely gratifying. So please continue to spread the word if you find these interviews interesting. On behalf of the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off for today. We'll see you back here again tomorrow on SALT Talks.